Chromebooks bring home to Linux, and Red Hat cozies up to Microsoft. FFmpeg sees a new release, and Ubuntu Mate drops 32-bit for good. And uh, check this out. We now have a plausible theory as to why NVIDIA really killed that GPP, but um, more about that in a minute, because we also have a handy guide for enabling overlays in OBS and uh, made by old man me. Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. But don't worry. Let's get into it because it's another great day for <laughs> Linux, everyone. Let's go. And welcome back to Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays, where we're going to sit back, relax, take that midweek break. It oh, is hello. that uh, time of the week where half of it's done and half of it's yet to come. Terrifying, exciting, petrifying, stupefying, I don't know. Ben Stone joined every week. Um, Hollywood Jill in LA, <laughs> keeping it real, uh, with a red hat shirt on. That's the thing. Yes. Yeah, that is the thing. And open shift. Open shift <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Space Britannia. What's up, man? Pedro Mateus. Hello. Everything doing yes, great? Yes. Oh, yes. Everything is doing great. We've been having some really nice weather. The show just started. I'm already talking about the weather. Already talking about Yay. We, we have officially <laughs> ran out of things to talk about, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, Jill, anything exciting happened to you since last week? Oh, well, yesterday um, I watched the Google I know IO keynote live and um, the Red Hat Summit keynote. And so we will be talking about that a little bit in our news. And um, um, I had started, I'm preparing a rig for Fedora 28. I decided I, you know, I'll give that a run on one of my main uh, rigs. And I know Jordan would approve. <laughs> so this will be the first time I'm actually going to use Fedora in, in my main systems. And um, it's pretty cool. <laughs> Neat. Uh, what's up, Pedro? Outside well, of the over here, I already have a Fedora 28 uh, laptop mm -hmm. that's been up and running since beta 2, which uh, actually has been doing pretty awesome. good. Uh, yeah, none of the updates really mm -hmm. messed with anything. So, yeah, Fedora is getting boring nowadays. So, that's something. Uh, the Chromebook, on the other mm -hmm. hand, uh, for the very first time, it just noped. It did the uh, shutdown sequence where everything goes uh, a very uh, weird shade of uh, beige. And it's like, oh, it's off now. Why did it do that? Turned it back on. It hasn't done it again, so... I'm going to just chalk that up to a fluke. Hmm. Not a whole lot to report huh. over here. I ordered a tsunami of batteries. Uh, we had a good month of Patreon, so let's bulletproof everything. And by bulletproof, I mean try to keep everything together and uh, suck it, Amazon free shipping. That's really all I have to say to that, man. <laughs> so, uh, that's that's going to be coming in. I had... Everything down here is getting a uh, fresh set. Everything upstairs in the network rack. I'm sure a lot of people listening to this show knows, know what the network rack is for your home media and all that to keep everything up. So we should be uh, able to survive thunderstorm. That'll be fun. It's, uh, nice. Yes. Uh, ter terrifying, mm -hmm. frightening, and uh, lightning <laughs> and all that. And it's like, you should cut off all electronics. We can go, nope, keep going. And, you know, <laughs> maybe hang a golf club out the window. Just put it on hard mode and... and so we end up with that. Okay, that's enough of that business. Let's get right into what's going on this week, starting with you can now run Linux apps in Chrome OS. That was uh, something that they brought up yesterday at Google I.O. <laughs> in this business. And, you know, this is uh, pretty neat. I mean, it kind of makes sense. You're going to be adding just a little bit of extra functionality to your Chromebooks. Not any Chromebooks, as Pedro points out. It's like they're starting out on the Pixel, which was which I agree that wicked overpriced one that I think six people bought and might have already been discontinued. We're not sure. It is going to be running in a custom VM. And what really made me happy, really excited, was it's not just going to support full GUI, graphical apps. It's how it, how it's going to be doing it with Wayland. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, yeah, awesome. That, that's <laughs> just neat. Now, Pedro, do you think I'm crazy when I'm looking at the notes? I said, hey, man, uh, they probably are going to start out with the hardware that they had a hand in making. And also, this is probably going to run like galvanized junk on like the sub $200 Chromebooks. Eh, 
Yeah. I would uh, probably disagree with that because this isn't really all that different from um, what uh, already happens with Crouton. Uh, Crouton, Crouton yeah. it basically sets up uh, sets up a CH route that you can run an entirely different graphical session uh, with whatever uh, desktop environment you choose, and it basically pulls all the uh, the packages from the Ubuntu repos. And this seems to be the way that Crostini, as they call it, will work. So it, it's probably not going to be all that different. Yes, granted, Wayland, uh, using Wayland instead of X, is probably going to have some nasty uh, side effects. But hey, if this means that Wayland actually gets up to snuff and we get to start using it more often, bring it. Yeah. <clears throat> Indeed. What do you think, Joe? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, what Pedro was saying about Crouton is absolutely true. I was amazed with how, how fast it works. Because again, yeah. you know, Chrome OS still has the Linux kernel, so it's it's not having to do much conversion. And um, yeah, so this is cool. So this is Google's attempt at getting developers onto their platform, which is awesome. And uh, Chromebooks will be cheap alternatives, of course, to Apple laptops for developers. Mm -hmm. you, go to, you go to the conventions and, and so many of the developers have, have Macs they're using. <laughs> and yeah, we, we talked about this a few weeks ago. And it's not just a terminal anymore, of course. It'll be a full suite of applications that can be enabled. Yep. So that's really, really, really exciting news. It is Makes exciting those Chromebooks news. even better. I gotta be all curmudgeon <laughs> about it because I want to sit there like, this is defeating the point of what a Chromebook's supposed to be. It's, you know, you do the power wash, you don't work it. It's indestructible. This, this is, uh, well, then again, I mean, it's going to be in a VM. There's ways to look at it like that, but mm, I don't know. It'll be fun to play with. <laughs> and again, yeah. and again, Pedro, I understand why you're grumpy because like, I want to play with it now <laughs> on mine. What do you mean? Yes. yes. <laughs> right. And I'm already running developer mode and I'm on the beta branch mm -hmm. and I'm doing all those things on my uh, Acer Chromebook. But I still don't have the little terminal app that lets me know that, yes, you can run Linux apps directly from Chrome OS without having to set up Crouton. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> We've been doing that for years, huh, Pedro? <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, Jill, tell me about well, this 25th of for... year summit with Big IBM uh, Cloud. Yeah. Well, one of the big, and actually, it's not insignificant. There were over 7,000 attendees at this year's conference, which was huge. Um, it went up uh, over 1,000 people, which was amazing. Um, but one of the big news stories here is that IBM is, is, is expanding its partnership with Red Hat and moving more of its software portfolio to Red Hat containers and Red Hat's OpenShift container application platform, which uses, of course, Kubernetes and Docker. And um, this will also be true for IBM's deep learning application, Power AI, which one runs the IBM Watson supercomputer APIs. So this, this actually was a really, really big deal that um, IBM isn't going to be uh, doing this in-house much anymore. It's, it's mostly going to be on uh, OpenShift and uh, Red Hat containers. Pretty mm -hmm. cool. It's mm -hmm. interesting news. I mean, it's not a big shock because yeah. Red Hat and mm -hmm. IBM are basically service companies mm -hmm. at this point. I mean, well, you know, it's like, what about the power architecture in the heart outside of that? <laughs> so, yeah, IBM is trying. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's good. And yeah. It's a good on Red Hat, but that's not mm -hmm. our only little bit of Red Hat news, is it? Oh. New and no. sticking to Red Hat and OpenShift, uh, coincidentally. Yes. Uh, it's, uh, well, uh, Red Hat is cozying up uh, to Microsoft on accounts of the massive infrastructure that Microsoft has built with Azure. And yeah, Azure just runs Linux. It's got that uh, really, really annoying GUI that Microsoft built on top of it, but it is still running Linux in the background. Mm -hmm. So it is really possibly a good idea for Red Hat to get on board with them, but it's like, part of me is still going, you're Red Hat. You have yeah. the infrastructure, <laughs> you have the manpower, you have everything you need to do this yourself. Why are you closing up to Microsoft? Is it because of the marketing department? Because if it is, I could totally get that. Microsoft has a huge marketing department. Most of it was used against Linux for a while, but eh, 
can be useful. Pedro, we're supposed to forget about all that. And it's all uh, hugs and rainbows. <laughs> and, uh, man, listen, uh, this will allow you to manage your open shift with Azure. So mm -hmm. that alone by itself is completely neat. Hashtag winning on that business. And mm -hmm. it's definitely a win for Red Hat's, you know, it's hybrid cloud tech. It's mm -hmm. good to see that. And yeah, you do have that bad taste in your mouth like but it's for the microsoft mm. <laughs> and yes. i understand i mean this comes from the register all oh, this is going to be in our show notes go check that out it's uh like right from the registers like embrace extent or what's the other one again legitimate worry <laughs> because you know, i just looked up before the show i was like wait a minute who can buy who because i i a couple yeah. of months back, I it was like, wait a minute, what would happen if Apple bought Disney? I'm like, wait a minute, Apple could buy Disney? I was like, with pocket change. <laughs> yeah. Turns out uh, Microsoft could buy Red Hat with pocket change because their 2017 revenue was $89.95 billion, while Red Hat's was 2.9. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We talked about that several weeks ago. Mm. <laughs> yeah, there was that big speculation about, oh, Microsoft could buy Red Hat. Yes, <laughs> we know Microsoft could buy Red Hat. It's, yeah, we hope they won't because we've seen what Microsoft can do. And yes, they have been very open and very friendly to Linux. But yeah, like Ven said, it's, uh, you know, uh, embrace, extend, extinguish. Well, there's also the one thing a lot of people don't like to throw back is like corporations aren't inherently evil. I know someone would be like, yes, they are. Ben, shut up. What are talking about? Uh, they're going to do whatever is the most money. their uh, their fiduciary responsibility is to their stockholders. It is to make more money. If attacking Linux is good for business, let's attack Linux. If embracing Linux and working in open source is good for business, we're going to be doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That and companies don't work on Fifi's. So I just want to get that. <laughs> as much as AMD would like you to believe otherwise. <laughs> up next, up next, we have uh, some improvements in uh, network stack. Jill, you seem to have the most to say about it. <laughs> yes. Um, well, uh, Simpty has just set a new, a new standard um, of accommodating higher bitrate audio video IP packets. And mm -hmm. um, the standard reads between one and eight gigabits per second for typical uncompressed high definition and ultra high definition formats uh, to be sent to our eyes. And, mm -hmm. um, um, and it's directing these audiovisual packets from source directly to Ethernet cards using NetMap, NetMap and bypassing the middleman, the Linux kernel. So it, it makes sending those packets a lot quicker. And NetMap, of course, is a framework for high-speed packet I.O. And a little bit about uh, um, uh, SMPTE, the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers, sets the standards and specifications for all motion imaging. Um, I've, I've been dealing with their, their standards for many years as an animator. And right. um, yeah, so it, <laughs> back in the day, it used to be a lot... Uh, less complex, I spent hundreds of hours behind half-inch and three-quarter-inch videotape editors editing animations with SMPTE timecode and BNC noodle. <laughs> so it, it's it's been a part of the television standard since it started. <laughs> well, the reason we just get that explanation is for the story yeah. <laughs> um, from the BBC's research and development. They're giving back to Linux, man. Uh, High-speed networking, open-source yes. kernel bypass. They've thrown that out. Good guy, Biebs, every now and then. Um, it has been set up to the. Bless you. Are you okay? Bless you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, oh, I'm fine. <laughs> I, I was going to mute you, but I, I didn't really have time. But <laughs> no, man. I mean, this is really cool. I mean, they're going to be sending yeah. like real world mm -hmm. eight gigabit transfers, and they developed this because uh, HD video transfer between their systems, it just was not that hot, and they've sorted it. They've sent it upstream. It's been adopted. And this is good to see for future proofing because you're like eight, eight to ten gigabit. That's crazy talk. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, it yeah. isn't. No, on no, no, a no. single thread, mm -hmm. they managed to get up to eighty gigabits 80. per second on a single would, thread. Yeah, which would support sixteen <laughs> k. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sixteen well, k. So. I, I think I've had my house for like seven years, and I wired everything before I moved in with a gigabit. 
And I remember buying the just a gigabit switch. That was still kind of pricey. Now you can't even find a budget switch or router that's gigabit built in. They're all gigabit. Yeah, yeah. Right. they're all gigabit, yeah. <laughs> so it's good to know, and it's good to see open source uh, working like that. I am, I yeah. don't say good on them. It's because, you know, they're not affordable right now. Well, they are affordable. I take that back. 10 Genix, they're a thing. Yeah, 10 Genix are basically where you'd expect a decent uh, network card to be nowadays. 100 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then you're it's, like, oh, that sounds uh, good. So you start looking into Tingy switches. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> because instead oh, of the oh, yeah, one or two ports, now you have like mm-hmm. yeah. seven, eight, whatever. It's, yeah, it's uh, the size. Uh, there's a sizable uh, price increase there. But yeah, 80 gigabits on a single thread, just straight audio and video and really not much of anything else to get in your way. That's That's really good. So That's really next, good. we get a new version of FFmpeg. It is out. If you don't know it, it's the back end to a lot of the video stuff that you might get away with playing with. A couple of new things in this. Uh, the one thing I really like is they've added experimental Magic YUV encoder. That's really interesting because think about uh, UHD, not 4K. I'm not getting into that argument. Uh, a <laughs> fraction of the size, yes. minimum impact during encoding. There's no decoder currently for it. And another big thing that I'm personally saw in here is OpenCL overlay filters have been yes. added. And you're like, well, that doesn't make it. I don't even know what that is. It's Moonspeak. Think about image processing, like unsharpening mask and stuff like that will have hardware acceleration. There's a gang of other features in here with uh, NVIDIA, uh, NV encode and all that, right, Pedro? Yep. Uh, well, not NV encode, but NV decode. Oh. Uh, with yeah. the last version <laughs> of uh, FFmpeg, they did update the header support for the new NV encode, but they still don't have uh, actual NV encode support because NVIDIA is still holding onto that very, very tightly. You do get wait, NV wait, decode. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait, we're we're going to be blowing NVIDIA up at the end of this, uh, but... <laughs> They're holding on to very tightly to a piece of customized hardware only found in their products. You can do hardware uh, NV encode, yes. <laughs> you can also do it yeah. in software because they've been doing it Which themselves totally with the older generation the of point. video cards. Yes, but it is a thing, and it could be useful to have that. You know, say have it work directly with the Nuvo drivers. That would be useful. But uh, what they do have with this one is. NVDEC, the accelerated uh, NVIDIA decoding, it's now built into FFM, uh, FFmpeg 4. Woo! Uh, it supports uh, <laughs> hardware accelerated H.264, HEVC, MJPEG, MJ, uh, MPEG 1, 2, and 4, EC1, VP8, and VP9. Uh, yeah, it's really, really good to see. Hmm. Jill, what are your thoughts? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm really excited about the experimental. Uh... Uh, magic yuv as well because um i've been using yuv for uncompressed video for very for a very long time and um it's uh this one's going to actually make the file size even smaller which will be nice (laughs) i I look uh, forward to playing with it i mean i'm not going to do anything crazy um but hmm, that's the thing it's ffmpeg we've made that about as exciting as humanly possible so, I really enjoy I mean, stuff like this. You're watching this show through the magic of FFmpeg through OBS, but mm-hmm. yeah, it's still there. Yes. It's you, the yes. A lot of people never think about it, and I, trust me, I, I'm going to go squee all over it later this week. And uh, yes, <laughs> okay, let, let's uh, do that thing where we say, "Why are you still running an i386 based uh, CPU? 64-bit is the future." Like ten years ago. Uh, it's official, man. Uh, mate, I-386 yeah. is no longer a thing. Wimpy rolled out, and he's like, we've taken the decision to stop making I-386. That's 32-bit Intel images. Starting with 1810. What does it mean? Oh, I don't know. From that headline, I'm going to take a wild guess, Wimpy, that uh, you're yeah. not going to be able to get those <laughs> I-386 images anymore. But uh, time to let it go. The reason they dropped it is they're going to be able to, you know, less than 10% of the meat users are running the i386. Uh, so that's not that big a deal. They'll be able to refocus the effort creating those images onto something else. And I, 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 I have to guess that if you are 
if you have a specialized device or anything like that, that you're legitimately keeping around, uh, for 32 bit only yeah. Pedro, you yeah. got some thoughts on Raspberry Pi, and I'm thinking maybe you could make yeah. that move. Maybe, I don't know. Crystal? Yeah, you can. Because when it comes to <laughs> ARM64, it can actually do a really good job of emulating uh, x86, the uh, yeah, x86 architecture, and running the x86 applications on the, that uh, ARM platform. With yes, okay, there's a bit of a performance impact. It's only like 70 mm-hmm. or 60 percent of the native performance you would get on that 32 box, uh, 32 bit box that you're keeping around. But it is you're probably much better off right now running a Raspberry Pi, uh, in like one of those laptop shells with a 33 watt hour battery than you would be with a 2007 to 2010 netbook, which right around 2010 Mm. is when they finally discontinued completely all the netbooks that were being sold with 32 bit only atom uh cpus that was the last of them so yeah i don't know man uh jill you like to hoard technology Uh, will this affect anything uh well i mean i i knew this was eventually coming and all my vintage computers i need to maintain them and keep them going but debian will be around to do that they are mm-hmm. the Swiss Army knife. They work yeah. on everything, and they're still going to continue to maintain um, the 32-bit architecture. And but this is not surprising because Linus, you know, he dropped support for i386 back in 2012. So you know, this this was actually coming. And of course, the new 1804 re- release, as uh, Ven said, um, concludes April uh, 2021, and will be the last release to support the i386 processor. And yeah. all the other distros are following suite. There was a call on uh, Ubuntu Beji also uh, will stop uh, 32-bit support. So it's it's coming. Yeah, we all knew that. <laughs> it yeah. Would come eventually. So it's just kind of, mm-hmm. we're starting to see all the spins follow suit with everyone else. I'm like, hey, man, we're getting yeah. rid of that. And Wimpy, Wimpy, listen, man, I, I, I like how you use the... Um, Second image in Google image search when you typed in i386 to put at the top of the yeah, I know. Yes, yes, I noticed (laughs) that's the thing. Um, coming up next, neat but not necessarily useful, which should definitely be a segment on this show, is look Mm -hmm. at this graph, right? Hashtag Nickelback, it's graph path. Look at this graph, (laughs) and what it does, uh, graph path is a very teeny tiny uh program that all it does is create some ASCII flow chart type things to show you how things are being routed through your network. It's, um, like Ven said, it's of questionable use. I guess if you're <laughs> doing a lot of network stuff and before you actually go into the router and start uh, setting things and uh, hard locking things to a specific route, you probably want to just have this, map everything out, you get a nice visual display, and then you just go, okay, I need to link this to this, this to this, this to this. Boom. Done. I guess that would be the one use case. I can't really see anything else. No, I, I yeah. Hey man, it requires zero dependencies. I installed this. I ran mm-hmm. it exactly once and absolutely went, that's neat. Then I immediately <laughs> got rid of it. So I didn't start moving stuff around so I could draw pictures. Um, <laughs> thought it crossed my mind. Uh, granted it is a questionable use, but Sorry, it's neat. You, you don't need any dependencies for it. Just boom, standard mm-hmm. net tools. Put it in and just kind of see what the topography of like your own network is. And I was like, yeah, that's boring. I didn't even put a screenshot up because I thought I was going to make a screenshot. I'm like, hey, everyone, look at this. I was like, yeah. no. Yeah. I know. No. <laughs> Pretty simple. Uh, you got thoughts on it, Jill? Yeah. Uh, my network diagram was rather impressive, though, because I have a 16-port Ethernet switch splitting off from six-port router. And I, I turned on uh, most of my computers in this room. <laughs> so it was okay. actually uh, quite impressive, but I do have to say, you know, years ago we used to flowchart a lot of this stuff, and and this is, you know, it's nice that it's automated. And um, for a case use, I, I did this one time um, using uh, Vim and the Draw It plugin years ago. I was just curious, so <laughs> I made my own uh, network uh, <laughs> diagram <laughs> years ago. So it's interesting. It's it's it's. You know, I'm probably unique in that respect, but but we have one that'll do it for you now. <laughs> All right. uh, Everyone let's... asks why. <laughs> Be- because of my render farm. And actually, it was quite important then. <laughs> for everything else, there's Amazon. 
Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, AWS, all the things. Ladies and gentlemen, I made a thing. It's called OBS uh, Linux Browser. I didn't make this plugin or the Discord chat overlay. Didn't make that, but I stuck the two together and made a little video with, um, look at that. I got all fancy and like, made screenshots and stuff like that. This is a neat little kit that is currently what we are using to display this little box. This is not something that you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're pulling a fastball on this Vin. You've been doing that for years, like five mm. years. We have, but we've nope. been doing it with multiple <laughs> layers and stacking effects. Yeah. And, and I, IRC. <laughs> and IRC. I'm just... Yes. <laughs> I went into this for just... I, I am doing every everything in in my power to free up real estate so I, I don't have to endure the everlasting shame of owning an ultra-wide monitor. Um, yes, that would fix all the problems, but we don't want to... Uh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> this, yeah. what this plugin does is it gives you... If you use OBS and if you use it for streaming, hey, man, if all these sites with the overlays and stuff like that, I, I know that's what the kids are using, you know, with, with the dancing chainsaws or whatever, however it works... And, uh, you know, the blanky stuff when people like and subscribe, mm -hmm. I don't know. This is a simple plugin. You can download it. It's just Chromium. So it's like 120 megs. You throw that business in out of the box, set up your source and boom, Bob's your uncle. It works, but you can also use it to simplify sources. Maybe you need to pull up a web zone or something like that. We're also going to be using it because we have vote.linuxgamecast.com. And instead of having to have that multiple times and jumping over, I just have that set up as a source. So when we're in the intermission between segments, boop, just pull that up and it's going to load the page right there. So I'm sure you can nice. find some uses for it. And again, I did my best to try to be helpful. I don't know. Sometimes mm -hmm. it works, sometimes yeah. it doesn't. You said in the video you were going to try to be in and out in less than uh, five minutes. Three minutes. Accomplished. It was like yeah, three minutes. Yeah, did it. Some odd change. <laughs> that's the whole, it, uh, listen man that is the whole point of the quick and dirty how to series because it nothing drives me up the wall more than when you you want a visual you, you want to see somebody do something before you start digging into it mm -hmm. and it's three minutes worth of information in a 14 minute long video of <laughs> incoherent rambling about <laughs> that it, you see, we've all been there right where you like jumping through the video trying to find where the information is contained and they're not doing it to get you to watch it they're just really poo at creating instructional videos you know yeah yeah and uh it, it really is that simple you create the folder uh for the obs plugin you extract the tar gz to it you load stream kit as long as you have the uh discord thing already running mm -hmm. boom that's it piece of cake and, and uh it works it's so simple, even I managed to make it work yesterday for the ever Everspace stream. It is so it's simple, so simple that mm -hmm. we might even get Jordan to use it <laughs> on stream on Aww. Thursdays, who is just <laughs> adverse to having live chat displayed anywhere on his stream. <laughs> okay, Pedro, let's give NVIDIA a hug before we get out of here. Yes, yeah, ah. one final <laughs> hug, because, well... The GPP is dead. You know that the GPP is dead. It was probably dead the moment that the rumor mill started to churn about uh, the shady things that NVIDIA was doing behind an NDA. I just well, want to say that this now. register article is saucy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> no, you can't yes. tell the... Uh, <laughs> the glad this is done thing or the why are you not explaining is what actually was happening because that yeah. was one of my uh, biggest issues with the GPP uh, or well the fact that they killed the GPP is that they really didn't explain they said oh there has been a lot of uh, mistruths and conjecture and whatnot about the uh, GeForce partners program but they didn't actually, you know, address any of those concerns. And in not addressing those concerns, it, they're just lending credence to that speculation. But hey, it's dead. They killed it. Good. Very yeah. good. Uh, the status quo remains unchanged. Radeon graphics are still crap. And NVIDIA is still just as scummy as they always were. Uh, listen, man, yeah. I'm tired of you showing for NVIDIA. <laughs> That, that's why I don't watch the show anymore because you're an NVIDIA show. And uh, uh -huh. uh, listen, I, here's because, the thing. Uh, wasn't... 
complaining about the 970 or anything. Nope, mm -mm, didn't happen, man. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just make up <laughs> excuses and use them on the internet. Uh, check this out. So everyone who's been out there recently cheering, which is cool, you know, it's uh, celebration time, which is great. It's like, yo, we did it, you know, Reddit or anything like that. It's like, yeah, we forced it. No, you didn't. Mm, no. You didn't. Not, yeah. not even. <laughs> the reason I put this register article in, because it did remind me of something. I was like, wait a minute, that could happen. Turns out there were rumors of it happening. And to quote from the article last month, some of those who had complained claimed in online forums that they had been contacted by regulators that rhyme with alphabet agencies like the FFC mm -hmm. or FCC. That's the thing. Uh, that makes infinitely more sense. I mean, granted, it's hearsay, but it's more believable than NVIDIA ever. And I repeat, ever <laughs> caving to the public pressure uh -huh. and, you know, canceling the GPP because... It was a distraction because we only got like two engineers, guys, and you know this is marketing. Mm -hmm. We, we, whatevs. Yeah. And uh, Asus created that second brand for Radeon cars just because they yeah. felt like it. See that? <laughs> can you imagine being like Asus or uh, a couple other MSI, and you've already made boxes, and printed stuff, right? Yeah. You got the stuff wow. sitting in a warehouse because you're like, okay, got to jump through the hoops because it's Nvidia, and mm -hmm. uh, Nvidia's like, oh, psych. <laughs> we're out <laughs> right yeah that's got a sting yeah. uh, especially EVGA since they're well the EVGA not so much because they're mostly NVIDIA but like Asus mm -hmm. they had the well they still have the ROG brand which was their gaming brand which included both AMD and NVIDIA products and it's like oh we've created Eris um, which is the new Radeon gaming brand and we're going to use ROG for NVIDIA and now it's oh Oh, okay. Guess we're sticking with wrong yeah. then. Hmm. That's the thing. Jill, what do you think? Uh, do you yeah. buy? Well, for the longest time, I know <laughs> you could legitimately say, like, but then you've only used NVIDIA. NVIDIA cards work out of the box on Linux, and they've yes. been working out of the box on Linux since the time of 3D effects, because 3D effects used to be really easy to get those set up on Linux with the RPMs and the Red Hats. Yes. And... <laughs> That's the only reason I use them up until very recently. And we're talking months time, Jill, was yeah. like the Vegas series. Now you're like, oh, you you could actually entertain the idea mm -hmm. of picking up a Vega. If, I mean, if you could find one, which is yeah, exactly. getting better and better. <laughs> what, so three effects. Yeah. Monopoly? I mean, they, they, oh, yeah. Oh, well, you know, uh, back in the day, they were trying to, to take over some of the chip manufacturers for motherboards and um, uh, secondary uh, graphics cards. Well, um, what 3D effects did S was... ST. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what killed 3D effects was they were going to start, which they actually ended up doing, producing their own video cards. Now, yeah. mm -hmm. that's what did them in because, you know, NVIDIA does like, what do they call them? The founder series and they print like six of their own... Yeah cards but 3d effects was competing against people who were licensing the tech to print their own cards and they're like well, why are we going to make yeah. cards to <laughs> go against your cards and then 3d effects boom nvidia bought them and nvidia cards got a lot better real quick yeah the voodoo cards really helped them <laughs> and glide voodoo. died yes voodoo oh yeah. yes. we're Goodbye, all sad glide. about that good riddance <laughs> oh my gosh i used to render out animations in glide it was pretty cool. <laughs> so. Considering, you know, for the time, Glide was very performant. It was the Vulcan of its mm -hmm. day. Yeah. Someone did yes. that. Um, yeah. All right. That's going to do it for the news. We got a slice pie coming up. But first, we do want to thank you making this show possible. That's right. Everyone supporting us on Patreon. We have somebody, actually, I think, supporting us on LibrePay. That's the thing. We got Amazon <laughs> affiliate links. Hang on. And uh, we got a wish list. Newegg, Humble, everyone shopping through affiliate links. Thank you. Thank you for that. Doesn't cost anything. And I try to reciprocate with that. PayPal, Bitcoin, you name it. But I want to get back to this three shot because we always forget to bring up the shilling penguin. J just so you know that, that, that we're shilling. <laughs> we're begging you for cold, hard cash so we can keep doing this horse and buggy show. Um, thanks, everyone, for supporting us, especially if you can do it through Patreon. If you get a few shekels laying around, maybe one or two, consider kicking them our way so we can continue doing some wild bizarre stuff um mm -hmm. do want to thank one um Mikhail g 
He's an executive producer. Yay. And on top of that, he's just like, hey, man. See, he's almost got his own wing in the studio. He, he, he's that close. Yes. <laughs> yes, he does. He's that close. Check it out. Th- that showed up. That showed up in the post. A brand new APC 1500. Mm-hmm. Right, right next to the old ancient APC. <laughs> and uh, that, that's part of our Keep the Power Alive initiative. Uh, we now have right now a 50-50 mm-hmm. chance of staying up during a power outage or nope. So thank you. Well, that. I guess you're running EXT4, yeah. so you should be fine. If you were running BTRFS, though, well, oh. I'm sure Strider will talk a lot ears off about BTRFS. <laughs> <laughs> there are our current patrons, 114, kicking us 215. Our next goal is making those horrible t-shirts that, that we've been threatening to make, which are effectively <laughs> yeah. made. They just have to be sent to the printers. But you do get access yeah. as a patron to a gang of special features, early access to things like our uncut series. You get your own custom podcast, our pre pre super shows. And that comes out. I think there's like almost a year's worth of those. You can go back and listen and um, come hang out with us. Like Pedro did yesterday. He played some Everspace. Yes. And it was a uh, boring stream because I was still learning the game, but I liked it. I liked it a lot. It no, was, it was uh, really fun to watch. <laughs> pretty good. Uh, our patrons allow us to do that stream because you, you get the Tuesdays. Jordan's got Thursdays where he plays. Usually, if you can find the game I would be the absolutely most disinterested in, that's, that's his jam. He gets that out of his system right there, and that's cool. Uh, and I bring up Fridays with the pre-pre, not the pre-pre, but the uh, All-Star Foo Bars. <laughs> Where I bring in all the patrons, you can come in and join. Uh, If you want to get in on the show with a voice, we do that. We find a multiplayer. Might be doing some serious Sam this week. Um, I say this month is our official, our first ratings off. We're going to see who has the best ratings because we effectively, all three of us have our own separate show during the week. 63 (laughs) views on uh, last night's... um stream at last count, so we'll see. Oh, that's cute, Pedro, (laughs) because this Friday I'm giving out puppies. (laughs) <laughs> that's not fair I'm going to start giving up games then. <laughs> I think puppies a win man I mean they're, I've already vacuum sealed them they're fresh and <laughs> stuffed puppies ladies and gentlemen stuffed puppy <laughs> okay that's enough that thanks everyone for making this possible we do love it and as always if you uh become a new patron or increase your pledge we give you a very embarrassing audible shout out for a long time during the show or on mm-hmm. saturdays time for a slice of pie that that either looks really mm. good or really bad that's Ew. a lot of raspberries on that pie <laughs> I don't know. which yeah, yeah it could be really good or really bad yeah, 50 50 on that <laughs> one um first bit pie drops but hey yeah, it's uh, the Raspberry Pi becomes a cycle exact mm-hmm. Commodore floppy drive emulator. Yeah, That's awesome. you heard that right. <laughs> uh, so if you had one of the old Commodore 1541 uh, floppy drives, you could. Uh, uh, it had the uh, built-in copy protection thing that would let you play those copy protected games uh, and everything else, basically the early forms of DRM. And someone was... Uh, Well, someone was either really stubborn or really didn't have anything else to do at the time. The two are not mutually exclusive. And he (laughs) or she or they decided to basically go and, well, let's try to make an emulator out of a Raspberry Pi uh, 3 that they used to uh, basically have a cycle exact. It works the exact same way, as far as the hardware can tell, it works the exact same way as the original uh, three CPUs that it had. It had like three different uh, processing chips that allowed that drive to do what it did. And the Raspberry Pi 3 with the ARM64 thing is, uh, it's got just enough juice to emulate those three chips with no issues whatsoever, and they actually managed to get some progress done with it, and it works. Uh, they say that it will be uh, the the binaries. If you just want to run this and you don't really care about the source code, it's already available on the creator's website. But the source will be released very very soon. So yeah, if you still have those um, copy protected Commodore games lying around and you really want to play them, 
you need to get off your space hopper and stop smoking indoors because this isn't the late 1980s, early 1990s anymore. <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> anyways, yeah, I actually have one of these in my collection. I spent a lot of money on it, <laughs> of course, back in the day. And uh, you can get them cheap on eBay now, though, but it's it's just really, it's even cheaper, of course, using the Raspberry Pi alternative, which is awesome. <laughs> So yeah. this was really cool. <laughs> I, I, okay, if you say so. This this is okay. <laughs> I, it's one of those things where I, I get it. I understand it. I can respect it. But I, I can't even throw a neat tag on this. Like, why? Oh, why? <laughs> Outside of just a raging need to do it, which that's the I can respect it part. 100% I can yes. respect it. But it's not like uh, what's coming up next. Uh, remember... When was it about two years ago that Intel's like, hey, man, stick PCs, they're the thing. You get a stick PC and mm -hmm. you, you, you can do everything you want with your stick PC. And like, what, what do you mean? You come back to them in 2018. You're like, we never made any of those. Crazy talk. Uh, but yeah. uh, we have the Pi Zero W. And uh, it seems that you can, in fact, shove that into a little box and make it a thing with the, what did they call this? Uh do they have a name for it? Uh, I uh, didn't see PC. a name specifically. It's They just called it a compute stick hmm. with the Raspberry Pi yeah. Zero W. Cool beans. Uh, I like it because, you know, it's got the HDMI. It's out. It comes with a little USB header. And, Jill, you wrote a gang of stuff about this, and you're being awfully quiet. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm being, <laughs> well the thing is, uh, before Intel made them, they were being made in China. And um, this is awesome because it's it's much better than than the ones of yesterday, which were plagued with performance issues and cheap manufacturing quality. And in, in, in fact, for one of my uh, for one of our, our raffles at uh, Scale 11X, our Linux Chicks LA raffle, um, I had ordered uh, four of these beasties, and only two of them worked. <laughs> so that was one of the reasons why you know, people stopped buying them because there were so many of them that were were bad on on the amazons and ebay and um but what's nice about this is it's, it's running linux not android and in fact i have uh i have my original one right here <laughs> so that's what they originally looked like and um yeah they're they're problematic <laughs> so yeah. so the, the the intel ones even had some issues but this is nice because you can just make one really cheap the Raspberry Pi Zero W. <laughs> so yeah. pretty awesome. Uh, the big problem <laughs> with the Intel ones were the fact that they came with Windows. Yes, but, Windows. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, <laughs> using the Raspberry Pi Zero W with this. Uh, if you don't have a TV that has an expansion uh, port that you could say shove a Raspberry Pi compute module into it, you could actually just get a Zero W. Uh, shove it into the uh, PS, uh, the PS, uh, the HDMI uh, port. Uh, run a USB cable to the TV's USB, or if you don't have the T, if the TV doesn't have a um, USB port, just run it off to the closest socket with an AC adapter. Done, and you got yourself a smart TV that can actually yeah. do some pretty nice stuff. It would be good to see, uh, although. The Raspberry Pi Zero W currently doesn't support HDMI 2.0 because when it does, you can actually have some remote control functionality to the Raspberry Pi Zero W. So that would be really awesome to see. Get an Amazon yeah. Fire Stick. Those are so yeah. cool. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I like them better than my Chromecast. I like this as always. Yeah. Uh, the PCB design and 3D printing, everything you need to uh, roll your own at home is available on the GitHub page. Again, that'll be in the show notes. Uh, that's cool. Uh, stick PCs and stuff like that. Uh, I have a Chromecast. I've never thought about making one with the zero. Well, I have a zero. I don't have a zero W because I just get in trouble. I don't stay away from that. <laughs> yeah, zero W has the advantage of the whole W yes. thing that's for the Wii fees. So, yeah. Yes. Mm. <laughs> All right, that's the thing. We're going to bounce out of here. Uh, we did get a little bit of feedback this week, but it was like one one was a question, and I think the other one was uh, just smash head against keyboard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't 
Good ones are fun, but that's for sure. Yeah, yeah the, the, those fun. Maybe we'll save those for another week and uh, put that in there. But if you want to get hold to us, uh, Pedro, they can just hop over and smash that contact button, right, fam? Pretty much. Don't call me fam ever again. Uh, you can just go to listkidcast.com and you <laughs> click the contact button, fill out the form. It's really easy. Just to make sure to pick LWDW from the little drop down menu. That's all you need to do. And, uh, well, yeah, no, 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 no notes to self. I can see you in the show notes there, man. Just knock it off. <laughs> no more fam Uh-oh. for me. <laughs> Uh-oh. What's Finn scheming? Oh, oh, it's the lower third. He's going to replace my lower third with Fam. I'm sorry, what was that, Fam? Uh-huh. <laughs> See, no, you're way too... Um... No, can't do that. It's Wednesday. It's not Saturday. I'm going to roll no. some credits. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's going to be a thing. It Possibly is. not next week, but when I least expect it, it's just going to be there. <laughs> Twenty years from now, it will be a thing. <laughs> hey, I'm the morale czar now, Ben. So you have to be nice to Pedro. No, I don't. <laughs> Hundred and seventeen episodes, and Ben's never been nice to me. I don't think he's a part of this. I know. Sport. No, I know. <laughs> You're excused. <laughs> you and Jordan are excused, and I guess I am to a certain point. <laughs> 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 <laughs>